Scholastic Magazine, which a lot of educators are familiar with, uh, posted a blog post about the five biggest fears of incoming middle school students, students coming from elementary or intermediate school and going to the middle school. The first was combination locks. They were worried about actually having to remember their combination and remember how to remembering how to do their combination. The second one was being late for class. And I don't know about you, but I'm 15 years removed from high school, and yet I still have dreams about being late to class. The other two more uh, tell us about and remind us about the pressure that's on our kids. One is that they, they fear about not having friends. The other one is that they fear about being different and standing out in a way that brings unwanted attention or criticism to themselves. And then the last fear was that they're, they're afraid of tough classes. They understand that as they get older, classes get tougher. They're, they're worried about tough teachers. And I think we've all been there. We, we can all empathize with this because there was a subject or there was a teacher where we, we really struggled in that class, whether it was math or science, language arts. In fact, there's one class that I think most colleges require that really trip some people up. People who are brilliant people who, who can pass and have a, a, an ace every other class have difficulty with this class, and that's public speaking. The, just the fact that they have to get up in front of their peers, get up in front of a big group of people, and to give a persuasive speech, an informative speech, to, to, to improvise, to do something, it's, it's a lot of pressure. And people who, who know what to say stumble over their words because of the pressure of everyone looking at them. Now, some people, they do fine in classes like this, but most people, this is, this is a hard one. And the truth is, speaking is a big part of our life. We might not give big public speeches, but, but we use words. Words are everywhere. Words are written, and words are texted, and words are, are, are read. Words are, are just everywhere that we go. And as with everything that we've been given the ability to do, when we speak words, those words are, or when we type words, those words are meant to be used as a, a tool for God's kingdom. In the New Testament, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he, he writes this about our words. He says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear frigs, figs? Neither can salt spring produce fresh water. Uh, James writes here and he says, here's the deal. You go and you praise God, you sing praises to God, you read God's word. And then with that same mouth, you go and you tear down people who are created in the image of God. Basically, the theme throughout the Bible, and James does a pretty good job of summarizing here, is that when it comes to our words, our, our words must be consistent with our faith. They, they need to go hand in hand. The same mouth that praises God should do God's will when it comes to interactions with other people, whether they're our neighbors, our friends, or even our enemies, whether we are saying them, texting them, or posting them. We have standards to live up to. We are called to love God and to love others, and so our words are meant to praise God and to express love and support to, to others. And this doesn't happen by accident. In fact, uh, Satan tries to use our words and twist our words to make sure that our words can't be used for, for the cause of Jesus. He likes to attack us and make our words diluted. And he, he tries to get us to have salt water coming out of a place where there should be fresh water coming out of. And he's been really successful with it. Christians are as guilty, if not more guilty, than in, the, in calling people names, in returning an insult with a harsher insult. In, in posting cruel or inflammatory Facebook posts, in participating in gossip, in swearing, in peddling conspiracy theories, 
all of these things dilute the witness that we have. In fact, that last one, Paul talks about it. He writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 7. He says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. We don't need to get caught up talking about hypotheticals that don't really exist when we have the truth. That's what we should be talking about. And so our words are important. And so it's important for us here this morning to go to class, to go to speech class. Now, don't worry, we don't have to get up and speak. I'm the only one having to do that this weekend. But we do need to learn about what God says about speech. Just like in other subjects, Solomon talks about this in the book of Proverbs. These are a collection that are mainly written by King Solomon to his son, who will succeed him as King Rehoboam. And Solomon, uh, in another work, in a book called Ecclesiastes, gives himself a title, and that title is The Teacher. Uh, so we are learning from the teacher uh, about, about what our words are supposed to do and about the danger of using words in the wrong way. And so today we sit down and we listen to Solomon teach us about our words. So is this is Speech Class 101. How do we make sure that our words align with our calling? Well, it starts with this. Step number one is that we need to ask ourselves before we ever speak, have I thought about what I'm about to say? A lot of us may consider ourselves quick-witted. A lot of us may feel like we're good at improvising. But the truth is that when it comes to improvising with our words or completely saying something out of instinct, we usually get it wrong because it goes into our ear and something goes into our brain and goes out of our mouth without ever passing through our heart. And Solomon knew this, and he didn't want his son to be a quick-to-speak person. In fact, he warns about being quick-to-speak about saying rash words, harsh words. Proverbs 13, 3, Solomon says, those who guard their lips persevere, sorry, let's try that again. Proverbs 13, 3, those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. Proverbs 21, 23, those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. Here, Solomon writes that, son, you need to listen. If you say things without thinking about them, if you're quick to speak, if you, if you constantly are talking, then you're going to say things that are really detrimental. To not speak rashly. To make sure that we weigh our answers. Now, I'm not trying to sensationalize our current situation or minimize it for the sake of an illustration for a sermon, but there's some similarities in what's happening now in our words. The truth is that scientists, everyone understands that the way this virus is transmitted is that it's droplets in the air. They come out of the mouth, they go into the air, and the same thing's true with words, even if they're digital. Once they get out of our mouth, they're out there, and we can't get them back. And so it's important for us to filter those words, because if not, they may discourage someone else, they might even harm somebody else when we speak out of impulse. As a Christian, we must weigh our words, and Solomon closes a loophole here that his son might look for. Because we're supposed to weigh our words even when other people aren't. Proverbs chapter 12, 16. Solomon writes, Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. What Solomon's trying to get his son to understand is even when no one else is living up to those standards, you are. Your measuring stick is not how other people speak and how they react. Your measuring stick is the word of God. And the same thing is true for you and I. Here's another way to put step one. If God were standing with his holy word open between you and the person that you're conversing with, whether that's in person or online, what words should you use? How should you say them? Chances are, if he was standing right next to you, you would consider your words carefully. And the truth is that God's always with us. In fact, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. So we need to make sure that we, as Christians, are filtering what it is that we're going to say. Step number one, have I thought about 
what I'm about to say. Another thing to consider is, before we ever speak, is to ask the question, who or what is influencing these words? Proverbs 17, 4. Solomon writes, A wicked person listens to deceitful lips, and a liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. There are far too many of us who say that we are Christians, who sound just like the news stations that we watch. We sound just like the family we belong to or the group of friends that we belong to. Or we post things just like the people in our echo chamber of social media post the same way. Um, the, the truth is we're supposed to sound like Jesus. But when we surround ourselves with so many other things, they influence our heart. They influence our words. I know I've used this illustration before in different settings, but... Um, there was a snow break that we had when Lindsay and I first got married. And so we did what people do now, except we didn't have Netflix. We had DVDs, and we binged watch a television show, which was House, a show that used to be on Fox with Hugh Laurie as, um, as, as Dr. House. And, and Dr. House was, was a smart aleck. Dr. House was, was somebody who was quick to speak. Um, and... There came a point, I don't know if it was day one, two, or three, knowing me, it was probably like halfway through day one, where, where Lindsay looked at me and said, hey, we got to stop watching this for a little bit because you are turning in to him. You're being sarcastic. You're, 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 you're saying things that you normally wouldn't say. And the truth is, I, I didn't even mean it. It was just because I had surrounded myself. We were binge watching this, and it just started to influence me. And the same thing is true for, for all of us. Whatever it is that is around us will influence our words. And so if it's not Jesus, we have to be careful because our words will not be from him when we are called to be his representatives. If you're not surrounding yourselves with, the, with things, with people who fit the expectations that are laid out in Scripture, then we need to not allow those things to influence us. There's a set of filters that Paul puts out there to the church of Philippi in Philippians 4, verse 8. He says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such those things. Consider what's coming in through, the, through those filters. Do... Do my sources that I'm pulling from, do my influences meet all of those criteria? And if not, they need to get rid of, be getting rid of, gotten rid of because they aren't influencing our words, and our words are powerful. So Solomon says, you know, weigh your words. I have a thought about what I'm about to say. Second thing is uh, to, to make sure that they're being influenced by the right thing. Then there's step three. And by the way, we're still not talking yet. I want to make that perfectly clear because the third question is to ask ourselves, how does what I'm about to say affect someone else? Well, let's be real. We might do one and maybe even two, but then just resolve to say whatever it is that we want to say. We don't care if it tears somebody down. We don't care if it demeans them. We don't care if we're spreading false rumors. We don't care because it gives us some sense of accomplishment or makes us feel better or puts us above somebody else. But as a Christian, that bar is raised. It's not just considering our words. It's asking how our words will affect those who hear them or those who see them. We are called to live as Christ. That means that we don't just consider what benefits us. We don't try to just make thing, things even or whatever puts people in their place. We, we genuinely think about our, where, our words and our actions and ask, how, how do these things affect other people? As Christians, we are big, yeah, I know I was going to struggle with this. We are bridge builders. We are not bridge burners. And that's what makes it so disheartening to see so many Christians who are currently standing on scorched earth, where they have absolutely devastated everything around them because they chose not to think about how their words and how they say their words and how those things affect other people. Look at what careless words can do. Solomon writes Proverbs 11, with their mouths, the godless destroy their neighbors, but through knowledge the righteous escape. 
verse 11, he says, Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. Solomon lays that out pretty clearly. If your words are destroying your neighbors, those who don't look like you, who vote like you, those who, don't, who have wronged you, who have a different opinion than you, if, if you are destroying them, then you're acting as one who is godless. If your words are destroying other people, even if they're bad people, if they're destroying people, then those words are words that are used in the same way that godless people use those words. Look at what else he says. He says, at verse, or chapter 16, verses 27 and 28, a scoundrel plots evil. And on their lips, it is like a scorching fire. A perverse person stirs up conflict. A gossip separates close friends. In fact, he re-ups on that idea of gossip in chapter 20, verse 19. A gossip betrays confidence, so avoid anyone who talks too much. Look at what Solomon says our words can do. And look at how he talks about how we're prone to do these things. He says it's a scoundrel that plots evil. It's a perverse person that stirs up conflict, especially in the church. That's why Paul spends a lot of time talking about divisions in the church. It's a perverse person that stirs up conflict. It's a gossip who separates close friends. See, the things that we are supposed to be tearing down as Christians are the influences of the evil one, not people. And so we need to make sure that what we are saying is truthful, but not only is it truthful, that how we're saying that truth is appropriate. Trish Harrison, uh, Tish Harrison Warren, in uh, her chapter on the book Uncommon Ground, says, Christians can use words in ways that are accurate but obnoxious, true but trite. But if we do so, we do not simply fail to be kind. We also fail to herald the kingdom of God. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 4.15. Instead, speaking truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. Paul says, listen, truth in love. You can't separate the two. Truth without love is legalism. Love without truth is leading a bunch of people astray to feel like their feelings are the right way. We must be speakers of truth, and we must do it in a way that is loving. That's why Jesus is perfect because he's the only one who's really ever figured this out, done it perfectly. We need to ask the question, how do these words affect other people? And how, how should I say them in a way that makes sure that they're for building up someone, even if we're correcting them, that they're there to, to be abundantly clear that we love them and that this is for their benefit. So we've talked for 18 minutes. I know there were some illustrations there. We've talked for 18 minutes on what we consider before we ever speak. A lot of what the Bible says about speaking is what we do before words actually come out of our mouth, before words are actually texted out. So what happens when they, they do manifest? What, what, what happens when they do go out into the world? Well, I think Solomon's pretty clear, and I think the Bible's pretty clear. Step four is that we make sure that we use our words for the kingdom of God. We've been hammering the dangers of words, but remember, words are important and they're powerful. And remember that it is with words that God created, and God said, let there be, and there was. Jesus was the word made flesh. It was with words that Jesus taught that he forgave, that he instructed, that he called Lazarus out of the grave. Words can be used for good. Words are an instance of something that we have as Christians that we need to redeem in the world that we live in today. Just look at what Solomon says words can do. See what he says words, words are. Proverbs 15.4. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. 1624. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. 
10, 11. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. 10, 20, and 21. The tongue of the righteous is a choice silver, but the heart of the wicked is of little value. The lips of the righteous nourish many, but fools die for lack of sense. I don't know about you, but I think this world could use a tree of life. Words that are like honeycomb. I think the world could use a fountain of life, a choice silver. I think the world needs words that su supply nourishment. And I think that we as Christians are the ones who have those words. And so it's up to us to make sure that we're saying them and that there's, we're saying them in the right way. In a world that speaks lies and theories, let's make sure that our words make it clear that our yes is yes and our no is our no. In a world that calls names, Let's be a people who actually call people by their real name so they know that we see them, so that we know that they have value. In a world that speaks out of anger, may our words bring peace. In a world where words are full of disagreement, may our words be words of reconciliation. In a world that uses all sorts of speech, but especially online speech, to divide and demean. May we bring Jesus, who is the one who holds everything together. I guess the, the main thing here is this understanding that in the Christian life, there's no room for lies or gossip or slander or conspiracy theories or name-calling or cussing or coarse joking. But there's plenty of room for life-giving words. Words that bring glory to our Father and love to our neighbors. David prays a prayer that I think is pretty fitting as we close out today. Psalm 1914, may this be our prayer together. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer.